Okay. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I want to just say a few words welcoming to our uh, uh, final multimedia series of the semester. There is a, a bit of a, an oversight in the program, and I just wanted to apologize and just read uh, what Will, had, uh, Will uh, Hartley had written about his work and his time here at, at MSU. Uh, Will's going to be graduating this spring, uh, along with Caleb Hindman, uh, who is up in the, up in the booth. Uh, so we have two senior presentations tonight and then we also have some electroacoustic comp uh, presentations and uh, uh, visual music and some uh, freshman work so it should be a really well-rounded sort of program so I just want to read just a little bit about what real Will writes. Um, I'm thrilled to finally finish my uh, music technology degree here at MSU. I hope to enjoy the, pre you know, the presentation of my senior capstone project. For the written portion of the project, I compared and contrasted the music of Tim Burton and Christopher Nolan's Batman <coughs> films, uh, composed by Danny Elfman and Hans Zimmer, respectively, paying special attention to the appropriateness of the musical languages which they employed, given the, the settings of their films, and how each scored for both Batman himself and the Joker. As for the creative project portion, I always thought it would be fun to compose music for cartoons and commercials one would see while watching Saturday morning cartoons, uh, Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. I, so I did just that for eight toy commercials and an episode of Care Bears, uh, Unlock the Magic. Uh, for this presentation, I've chosen to show five commercials and the final climactic sequence of the cartoon. Uh, Will was born, Will, sorry, Will uh, Hartley was the, was in the second year of music technology class here at MSU, the class of 2011, and he returned to Bozeman last spring to fin finally finish his degree. He's grateful to Dr. Antas and Bolte for advising him through the end of the degree and allowing him to the capstone through independent study this fall, as well as Christy McGarity, uh, the former music technology head and founder of the program. So thank you so much, and we'll just go ahead and bring up Will. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Will Hartley, and as you said, uh, I, I did my written portion on comparing and contrasting the Danny Elfman music versus the Hans Zimmer music in the Batman films. That was Danny Elfman's Batman theme from the 1989 uh, movie Batman. 
And uh, it's a very famous theme, and uh, it's effective because you actually hear Batman. The da 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 da. It's evocative of something creeping in the dark and then pouncing on the last note. And the theme is uh, it emphasizes one in five, which is typical for music that uh, it signifies heroism. And the late romantic idiom, idiom is, is effective because Bruce Wayne is a uh, complicated character who kind of op operates in the gray area between crime and the law and late romanticism is uh, like emotionally flexible for a, for a flexible character. And uh, here's Hans Zimmer's Batman theme. That's it, just two notes. So a very different tack than Elfman took. Um, and I, you can interpret these two notes as um, simply mirroring the development of the character, which is in line with Nolan's, Christopher Nolan's goals for the character in the trilogy, which was to make Batman as interesting as his rogues gallery. In terms of setting, um, the original Batman displays conflicting visual cues for setting, and so Late romanticism is kind of like the default idiom for film music, and so using that kind of timeless idiom to convey something with conflicting visual cues kind of makes sense. And on the other hand, yeah, on the other hand, for Zimmer, he was kind of going for like the complete opposite effect. He wanted, instead of timeless, like Elfin wanted, he was going for realistic and contemporary, and he was like exploring what would actually happen if Batman actually existed, and and there was a vigilante dressed up as a bat beating the crap out of criminals. And so um, he used minimalism to consciously avoid using kind of like that safe feeling of, of safe, everything's going to be all right feeling of late romanticism. And this allows the viewers to be in the here and now and uh, makes the consequences of Batman's presence more like believable. Both eras of the franchise dealt with the Joker. And um, for Elfman, um, Jack Napier on the left, who became the Joker, is kind of a uh, kind of like a, a boring character, and for, uh, and Elfman didn't give him any musical identity at all. And after his transformation into the Joker, um, after his transformation into into the Joker, um, brain fart. Um, the Joker is isn't given any original theme to compete with Batman, but he does make other people's music and art his own. Here's a little glimpse of the Joker's music. So you've heard music like that before. You've heard a waltz like that. You can tell that that's Prince and not the Joker. Yeah. And, and you've heard that melody, that kind of cliche, da -da 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 -da, melody before. And so the Joker's music is nothing original. And uh, similarly, he, he paints over other artists' visual art. And, he, and he's seen at one point making photo collages. So he's, he's an artist, but he's like unoriginal. And uh, so Elfman and Burton are painting him as a as a frustrated artist. In The Dark Knight, Zimmer wanted something in counterpoint to Batman's minimalist two-note theme, so he went even more minimalist, giving him a one-note theme played by electric cello and guitar played, electric guitar played by a razor blade. Um, this note accompanies the Joker and, uh, for, or signals that he's about to strike, and I argue that, it's, that the fact that it's one note is significant in comparison to two notes. Um, Bruce Wayne endured trauma and then rose above it, so he gets two notes. And, and the Joker, like, was the, the Joker endured trauma and then didn't rise above it. Just kind of like festered into the Joker, and so he gets one note. And so, for Zimmer, the Joker was ultimately um, like a sign of like psychological arrested development. And for Elfman, he kind of did something similar, 
and that the Joker was ultimately undifferentiated from the gangster he was before. Uh, here's a quick, well, in the interest of time, I'll, quick, I'll skip that one. And, uh, So uh, that's a quick rundown of my paper, and for the creative portion, I created original music for cartoon and commercials, as you would see on, on Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. And here's a, it's a 15 minute video edited down into five minutes for you right here. They're not 
They're gone, and you're the 
All right, guys, how we doing? Doing great. Everybody kind of tired? No. Yeah, sure. All right, <laughs> let's make this kind of quick then. Uh, I did my capstone on, forty, on affording an orchestral career through multiple methods. I've been chasing the dream of having an orchestral career as a performance uh, major and player. Uh, and this is my plan as well as my um, current methods for making that a reality. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it just worked. That's so sad. Oh. Hey! Hey! hey. Oh. Let's go. Okay. Great. There we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So the orchestral career outlook. Uh, it's like uh, competing at the Olympics with way fewer sponsors and significantly less pay, like hundreds of thousands of dollars less pay. Uh, so, you know, you're kind of in for a shit show however you go. Uh, one interview could have over 100 people uh, take the audition for Second Trombone in Bozeman. That had 28 people show up. Uh, when you look at auditions for like Chicago, Atlanta, etc., you have uh, hundreds of people, if not a thousand people apply for the audition and over a hundred will show up for that audition. Uh, and then you have the audition costs too. All of your housing, all your transportation, your stay, your food, none of that is paid for by any of the orchestras that you're going to audition for. You are paying for all of that. So say you're coming from Mon Bozeman, Montana and you're flying to New York or down south to take an audition, that's a thousand bucks. And you, no one might get the job. Come on. Do you mind, Dr. Bolte? Thank you. Wow, okay, that's fun. <laughs> so, uh, two main methods that I came up with, the challenges presented are affording auditions, getting into an area with lots of freelancing and teachers available, and listening to the best orchestra possible in person. These are all essential things if you want to have a career as a performing orchestral musician. Without these, you don't have a huge chance. My two main methods for making this possible are, one, via classical recording and audio engineering. Um, I currently work here as the technical director for Reynolds. Uh, a bunch of summer festivals uh, like at Chautauqua and Tanglewood and etc. all need recording engineers. Those have phenomenal people performing in those festivals as well as faculty and major orchestras. This is another way to get there if you don't get in as a musician. Um, working both sides of the glass is an essential factor for that. If you are able to communicate with both musicians and engineers, it also lines you up to be able to work in that field better. The second method is through video game sound design. Now, while this doesn't seem quite as linked, uh, what it does is it allows you the best chance for working in audio and in music to work remotely. So you can sort of pick where you'd like to live and, and even if you can't, most of the major studios are in like San Francisco, LA, near major orchestras uh, that you'd want to go and listen to with players who you'd want to study with, especially that I would want to study with. Also, it's just about the best paying job you can get as an audio person. Um, the pay for Engineers in the AAA market right now ranges from about $70,000 starting to $120,000 starting. Thank you. Is it gonna go? There it go. Oh, God. Okay, there we go. Great. Uh, so, video game sound design. This is what I have written a decent chunk of my paper on and have also uh, done an interview with the current sound designer and started building my way into. Uh, again, it offers great pay and the possibility of work remote. Um, I interviewed a current Blizzard employee who originally worked at this school about how they made their way into the company. Uh, it wasn't through an internship. It wasn't through... Um, uh, just landing the job, what they did is they had been working for years doing film scoring and working on sound design and then got lucky with a temp IT audio job with Blizzard. Uh, after working in that job, they made good friends with everybody and the lead sound designer t uh, was having a conversation with them and offered to train them and mentor them to become a sound designer. She said yes. Within seven months, an opportunity opened up on one of the major teams. Uh, she applied for the job, which only wanted people who had shipped AAA games, and she, in fact, beat someone who had shipped multiple AAA games. Um, so that shows to me that if you have a good mentor and you are willing to learn and not stuck in your ways, you are hireable. Uh, and there is a way to get into these major AAA companies without already being a senior in the field. 
Um, so another part of this was I've been building resources for reels, practicing uh, fully, and um, creating a sound <laughs> library. And I've also made a mobile fully station uh, with foam padding on the inside in order to get rid of early reflections so that in my recordings for fully work, I don't have to deal with that. And it also makes it transportable so I can record from anywhere if there's a better location or not. Um, the second uh, part of this was the study of DECA uh, in the classical recording practice. DECA Studios methods are used all over the world by Abbey Road, Warner Brothers, Sony, and more, and orchestras and performers are turning to live streaming more and more often. The person preceding me took a job in live streaming and recording uh, in La Jolla doing uh, phenomenal work for classical musicians. This is a field that helps the classical scene stay active and thus is becoming more and more employable and more and more in demand. Uh, in my study at DECA, I practice the implementation of multiple techniques in my technical director job. I've listened constantly with different setups at, that a bunch of students may not have realized. I've put up setups while different ensembles, small and large, have been performing and have listened to them uh, based off of my distancing and calculations to pick the best ones for this hall and for the ensembles. And then um, I've tracked and logged all of these setups as well as notes, positive and negative, on each one of them and the recording methods utilized. Thank you. Ah, there it goes. All right, so some of the implementation I used. Um, one of the main ones was for recording piano within this hall. This hall is really well built for solo performers or a performer with an accompanist. Uh, in order to record piano well, you, what you want to avoid, as you can see up here, is the phase uh, issues that you can see in a phase scope in the top right and the two bottom options, both of those will uh, mutilate your sound and also just make it not pleasing for the ear to hear. The upper left, if you can accomplish that phase scope and what comes first is of course hearing, but what you hear uh, will be iterated by that phase scope. Uh, so in comes Decca's method of recording piano, which uses a spaced pair aimed at low C and at uh, upper C and spaced out about four to five feet and five to six feet up. I found that five feet out and five feet six inches up gave the best version of the recording for this. Um, in addition to that, the LCR piano deca technique, which is used for recording a piano with an ensemble uh, in order to isolate it and keep the blur out, I found to be the best method in translating to recording jazz in this hall. If you all can't tell, this hall is stupid live and jazz does not do well in here. A drum kit will just fill this room everywhere. So a deca tree, for example, just thrown up will have tons of drum bleed and the recording will be basically unusable. In order to mitigate that, I took the LCR uh, type of piano miking, which you can see in the upper right corner, and I took that to apply to the group with isolated miking per uh, the rhythm section. Um, and, and I will play a section of that later. Um, and then going even further, my system that I determined to be the best for recording large ensembles, mainly orchestra in this hall, was the four mic deca tree uh, developed by Kenneth Wilkinson. Kenneth Wilkinson was the one of the major proprietors at DECA and a major trainer at Abbey Road and for the Royal Music Academy in London for a long time. Uh, uh, once he developed this four, DECA, four mic deca system, this is what he stuck with for all his, his recordings, and it's been used for really famous recordings like the 77 Chicago Symphony Orchestra with Sir George Sulte at Medina Temple. Within this room, because it is so live and the orchestra does not super well fit on this stage, that four mic system works really well with an addendum. Um, the two mics are brought in a little bit closer, so instead of 36 inches, it's brought into 36 centimeters. And then outside, instead of it being uh, 12 feet left and right, brought into 10 feet 6 inches for the outriggers, uh, keeps the phase in check within this hall. Um, on top of that, in order to simulate the reverb of this hall, I uh, used an old school technique and combined it with inspiration from Alvin Lucier's I Am Sitting in a Room. It's a music tech piece which takes I Am Sitting in a Room and uh, takes about a paragraph long speech, plays it through a mic, and that is played through four speakers continuously back to the mic and reiterated on a loop, giving you the frequency sounds and, and the sound nature of the room itself. 
utilizing that concept plus the uh, some of the DECA reverb live miking and the reverb technique used to record within Kingsway Hall and in cu more current recordings uh, done in 2001 in that Lionsgate Studios. Uh, I used that in order to create a reverb in, uh, from this hall, unique to this hall, to put on top of the orchestra recordings. Give it like 10 seconds and it'll go. All right, and these are the results.
thank you guys so much. I'm gonna graduate. <laughs>